It's a blessing, man, to be back in the house of the Most High, yo. Back in the house of Dallas, man. Y'all can hear me? Mr. Dell, I'm good? Yes, Lord, it's a blessing. It's a blessing, man. You know? Ooh, we thank, man, the worship team, Miss Ebony. You know what I'm saying? The drums, man. And the brother on the keys, Lucius. You know, I don't know all their names right now, but we thank y'all for bringing us into the presence of the Most High, man. Ushering us in, y'all. Ooh, another day in the house of the Lord. That's what David said. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wicked. Ooh, in the tents of the wicked, y'all. And man, we just thank the Most High God. And I just want to give some shout outs and praise, man. God is good, y'all. God done open up the door, man. You know what I'm saying? We just signed our lease, y'all. We gonna officially be in Dallas, y'all. <laughs> God is good, man. God moving, man. Shout outs to Pastor and First Lady, man, for coming through, man, in an awesome way. You know what I'm saying? Just, just helping out, man, with what the Lord doing, y'all. So it's a blessed time, man. It's a blessed time. God is on the move, y'all. He opening doors and splitting seas, coming down and, and move things, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When we find ourselves in places that look like hindrances. <laughs> Ooh, it's only, it's only a, a chance for God to show up and show out, yo. That's where he show his mighty strength, Matthew. When it look like it's down, when it look like it's, it's lost, Ooh, when it look like it's broken, when it look like it can't get no better, that's when he show his strength. I just son Deacon Bear that text, man, <laughs> in 2 Corinthians, you know what I'm saying? And our weakness, y'all, his strength is made perfect, is made perfect. And that's what, that's what Paul said. Paul said, I boast in my affirmness that the power of God might rest upon me, might rest upon me. So, Father, we just thank you, God, for another day in the land of the living, God. We thank you for allowing us to be in Dallas again, God. We thank you for the mighty things, God, that you're going to do, Father Lord. No eye have hear, heard, no ear have, no, ooh, no eye have seen, no ear have heard, God. Ooh, all the things that you have for them that love you. So we thank you for that as we give you glory and honor, Father. We ask that you bless this night, bless this word, God. We ask that you come against every scheme, every tactic of the enemy, God. Be with us, O King. And Father, speak your truth with clarity and bring us, God, into this priestly office, Father Lord. Bring us, God, into prayer, God. Bring us, God, into revival, God. Bring us, God, into increase, God. Bring us, God, into overflow, God. Bring us, God, into abundant place of blessings, God. Restoration, God. Ooh. And blessings upon blessing. We thank you for it even now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So, so y'all, we've been, we've been, man, digging, man, in this series, y'all, and and we're going to soon begin to start releasing these videos, man. But, but we've been getting into some deep stuff, y'all. You know what I'm saying? They say in the Old, they say in the old Testament, in the Hebrew, that, that is words of God doing. You know what I'm saying? And that's what it's been. It's been some heavy words, y'all. Some words of God doing. And God just been blessing us, man. He been blessing me in my life. He been blessing me, y'all, and leading me. He say, order thy steps with thy word. You know what I'm saying? And, and we've been just talking about this title, y'all. Israel, forsake not the ministry of being priests. Forsake not the ministry of being priests. And we came out of Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. I'm going to read it, y'all. I'm going to read it. And we're going to take our time. We're going to go in. And I'm going to be sufficient with the time, y'all. By the grace of God, you know what I'm saying? The Bible say in Joel, y'all, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. 
Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Verse 18, the Bible said, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Lord, bless your word, Daddy. For we nothing without you, God. So have your way, God. Multiply, God. Oh, the, 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 the little fish in the loaves we have. Multiply, God. Oh, and feed the multitude, Daddy. And we promise to be ever so careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Well, y'all, we've been going through our first point, y'all. If you remember, an understanding of the day of the law. Because that's what the book of Joel is all about. In chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, Miss Ebony, Joel, he speaks of this phrase, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. So we went deep into this first point, yo. You know what I'm saying? And now we want to get into this second point, yo. You know what I'm saying? We left off last time, yo. And I'm going to try to get straight in it for the sake of time, yo. We left off last time just going deep into what the, 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 the nature of the day of the Lord was. We not only looked at the nature, we looked at the timing of it. You know what I'm saying? We looked at the, the scope of it, theologians call it, yo. You know what I'm saying? That ranges narrow towards the nation of Israel, but also ranges wide towards the nation of men. Then we went into the nature of the Lord, just breaking it down, y'all. And then we got into this last thing. We got into this last thing of how God, y'all, he draws people. He leads us to life, y'all, not just by his goodness. Not just by his goodness, but the scripture we came out of in Proverbs 19.23. You know what I'm saying? The fear of the Lord leads to life, y'all. And whoever has it rests satisfied. We said that, that, that the fear of the Lord leads men to life, leads women to life, and God will use that. And I gave my testimony last time because that's how he brought me in. He brought me in through his fear, y'all. And, and glory to God for those who was brought in by his goodness. But we, we talked about how in these last days, y'all, in these last days that we living in, y'all, God, y'all, is going to draw his people by the droves. Who he going to draw his people, y'all. Who us Hebrews, y'all. Them who got the oracles of God in their DNA, y'all. Us people with hard heads and stiff necks that the Bible talks about. He going to draw us with fear, y'all. <laughs> he going to draw us with fear, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And we talked about that fear being the day of the Lord. Of judgment and wrath on one hand, but on the other hand, restoration and blessing. Simultaneously, y'all. And that's the fear of the Lord. We even brought it to the New Testament, talking about Ananias and Sapphira. How God had to bring fear into the church in order for the church to kick off. Kick off in a way that it never did. People start coming in by the droves. Miracle signs and wonders start happening, y'all. That's the time when they was passing by the shadow of Peter and being healed. It was all brought about by the fear of the Lord. But not only that, the church was respected. Respected by those that didn't want to come in. Respected by the unbelievers. It said in the scripture that they, they esteemed them highly, yo. And we know those that did believe, whoo, they came in by the multitude, by the droves. And we talked about that, yo. And this brings us straight to our second point, yo. You know what I'm saying? Talking about this, this day of the Lord, yo. This day of the Lord. Our second point is let the priest. <laughs> Let's get into it. Let the priest, yo. And we get this from and we get this from the A part of our scripture, y'all, in verse 17. 
Joel 17, the A part of the scripture, yo. I'm going to read it. It says, yo, let the priest, Joel chapter 2, verse 17, the A part, I'm going to read. It says, let the priest who minister to the Lord. Let the priest who minister to the Lord. He's the Lord's minister, yo. He ministers to the Lord solely. Oh, God. He's devoted to the Lord. He's fixed upon the Lord. Everything that the Lord needs, yo, he's at the beck and call of the Lord. That's the priest. That's the priest. He ministers unto the Lord. But we're going to get into he also stands in the gap for the people. He stands as an intercessor, yo. He stands as an intercessor. You know what I'm saying? Let the priest who minister to the Lord. So we see, y'all, that the prophet Joel, in this second chapter of verse 17, he calls unto the priest, y'all. He calls unto the priest. Now, within this second chapter I have in my note, you know what I'm saying? Because he calls unto the priest, he says, let the priest. Now, within this second chapter, Joel, y'all, just like in every other chapter, in the book of Joel, he proclaims what we learned and talked about in our first point, yo. A phrase called what? I just spoke it. The day of the Lord. It also can be called what, yo? A day of visitation from the Lord. Where God pulls out both his wrath and judgment upon one hand and also restoration and blessings on the other. Now, to go a little deep into chapter 2, y'all, Joel in chapter 2, he describes the day of the Lord. I have in my notes, he describes it as a gloom of dark clouds. He describes it, y'all, as a gloom of dark clouds. He also describes it, y'all, as an invasion of a military army. He describes it as an invasion of a military army, y'all. So this is how chapter 2, y'all, Joel describes this day of the Lord. Now, if you remember in our first point, y'all, we, did, we, 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 we didn't tell you how Joel described the day of the Lord, but we told you, y'all, his state of view and how he speaks of the day of the Lord. The state of view he speaks of it from, y'all, I have in my notes. We told you concerning chapter 2 that he speaks of the day of the Lord from a state of view of imminence, y'all, of imminence, meaning in the present tense, meaning, y'all, something that's coming, something that's approaching in the now. It's something that's coming in the here and now. It's not coming later, y'all. It's not coming tomorrow, but it's coming now. He speaks of it in the present tense. And we see this in chapter 2, verse 1, y'all, in the C part of the verse. And I'm going to read it. The Bible say, blow the trumpet, y'all. In Joel chapter 2, verse 1, sound boot, I don't know if I gave it to you. He said, blow the trumpet. Meaning, in this trumpet, y'all, it means a horn of warning from danger. A horn of warning from danger. In Zion, it says, it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. The Zion is no other than the city Jerusalem, y'all. He also says, he says, blow a trumpet. He say, in Zion, he say, in the sound, sound of alarm, sound of alarm in my holy mountain. Talking about Zion, y'all. And all the inhabitants of the land tremble. But where we want to be, y'all, in this sea part, he said, for the day of the Lord is coming. Ooh, just like we talked about. Meaning in a sense of just what it's saying, y'all, I have in my notes. It's approaching. It's coming, y'all. But it's approaching when I have in my notes. You know what I'm saying? We see it in this next part of the scripture. He says, for it is at hand. That at hand, y'all, it means that it's approaching now. It means that it's coming now, y'all. That's what it means. 
So when we connect the description of the day of the Lord in chapter two with the state of view of how Joel, Joel speaks of it, y'all, I have in my notes, y'all, it would be like us chilling together, y'all. We chilling and we sitting down, y'all, and we look up into the sky, y'all, and we see a cloud, a gloom, dark cloud coming, y'all. And it's not coming next week, no. It's not coming tomorrow, no. It's not even coming an hour later. But we look up and we see it coming now. <laughs> we just chilling, y'all. You know what I'm saying? It's also, y'all, like us chilling, y'all. And we look out and we see an invasion of an army that's coming. That's approaching, Nick. And it's not next week, no. We can't prepare for it, no. It's not like, oh, it's coming tomorrow like the forecast. <laughs> but we look out and we see this invading army, Mr. Dale, coming upon us now. <laughs> That's the way Joel describes the day of the Lord in chapter 2, y'all. That's the way he describes it. You know what I'm saying? And this Joel is prophesying this, y'all, in the midst of his people. He's prophesying this in the midst of Israel. Prophesying this. Prophesying. Speaking the word of God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? God using Joel as a, as a, as a, ooh, as a, as a, as a pass through to give his word. You know what I'm saying? He's speaking prophecy to his people. So now let's quickly look, y'all, at how chapter 1 differs from chapter 2 in describing the day of the Lord. We going somewhere, y'all, because Joel describes the day of the Lord in chapter 1 different, y'all, from how he describes it in chapter 2. You see, chapter 1, he describes the day of the Lord as being a plague of locusts, y'all. A plague of locusts. A plague of locusts. And I went back and I studied that and I look at that and I say, man, what's coming? And I, and I pull it up, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And it said in 2024, you know what I'm saying? We going to see an increase in, in um, cicadas. That's how you say it. <laughs> and locusts, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And this Joel speaking this thing years beforehand. But it's funny, you know what I'm saying? And we're going to get into it, how this, this day of the Lord, John MacArthur say, is a general. Ooh, is general. Meaning that he prophesies it, y'all, in a general state of being. In a general time period, y'all. And we're going to get into it, meaning that you can't conduce the time. You know what I'm saying? In this plague of locusts, it devours the land, y'all. It brings forth famine in the land. It brings forth famine unto the people. Now, we also told you about the first point as well. You know what I'm saying? In our first point, we also told you how Joel speaks of the day of the Lord in chapter 1. We also told you that as well, y'all. And he speaks of it from a state, not of present tense, Nick, but of past tense. A past tense, and that's key in where we going, y'all, because God going to open this thing up for us. Because, Joel, you going to see that it's a prophecy. Mm. You see, most just want to bring you commentary on the scripture. Most just want to bring you the context of the scripture. But Jesus said these words that I speak are spirit, man. We got to also bring spiritual revelation, y'all. We got to also bring prophecy. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus. We got to speak this thing according to the spirit. The old saints would say it like this. What does say the Lord? <laughs> Not no old word, but a rhema word, Miss Tara. Because we want to see change in our, our, our lives in the here and now. We want to see change. We don't want to just be doing this thing for nothing, Matthew. Nah, we want a rhema word from the Lord. We want a noun word for the Lord. You know what I'm saying? 
But Joel speaks this thing from a state of view of past tense, meaning having already happened, y'all, having already manifested itself in the land. And we see this in chapter 1, verse 15 through 16. And I got to give you the scriptures, y'all, before we get into it. Because you got to see this thing. You got to go back and study this thing because it's going to bless you, man. Joel chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Y'all, look what it says. It says, alas, A-L-A-S. And this is just an added injunction, y'all. And it means woe. It means woe. It said, woe for the day. <laughs> and that woe is the same woe that the angels cried in Revelation. Woe. Whoa, whoa, yo. You don't want whoa. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For the day of the Lord to continue. For the day of the Lord is at hand. You know what I'm saying? It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. When in this day, when is this day at hand? I have in my notes, y'all. Joel tells us in verse 16. He says, Is it not, is not the food cut off? Before our eyes? Is it not cut off before our eyes? Joel is saying this thing is like it already happened. It's like it already done took place. Joel could see this thing. He involves himself in this thing. Saying, he said, is our food not cut off before our eyes? Is the joy and gladness of the Lord not cut off before our eyes? Based upon this, clearly, y'all, Joel is speaking from a state of view of past tense. Past tense having already happened. This day of event in verse 1 having already manifested itself. Now, based upon the way Joel speaks of it, y'all, most commentators look at this day of event in chapter 1, y'all. They look at it and they put it as taking place. In an Old Testament time period. They put it as taking place in an Old Testament time period, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And, and, the, and the thing is about that, nobody know the time that it really took place. It's a prophecy, y'all. Oh, and we're going to get into it. John MacArthur, he says it like this. So, you know what I'm saying? Not John. He said, they say it like this. They say, so they don't know if it took place later in the Old Testament or if it took place more earlier within the Old Testament. But John MacArthur, he just keep it, you know what I'm saying? Right? He said like this because it could be on any side and we're going to get into this thing. And this thing going to show us what's going on today. How this prophecy is for today. <laughs> it's for today, Shane. It's for today, and we've seen it happening, y'all. You know what I'm saying? John MacArthur says it like this. He says it's contemporary to Joel, meaning that, 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 <laughs> that it's according to the day of the life of Joel. It's according to the, the, the living time of Joel. And as I begin to think about that, I'm looking at that, and I'm like, Yo, he just said it's competitory to, it's, 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 uh, let me get the word right, y'all. It's, con it's contemporary to Joel, meaning during the life of Joel, y'all, because he involves himself. He places himself in it. He says, we see the food being cut before our eyes. Now, the thing is with that, and we're going to get into it with John MacArthur, it could be two ways, yo. It could be that this is a historical fact that took place during the life of Joel. Or this can be a prophecy that Joel is prophesying of a past tense event, yo, that never even happened yet. <laughs> he could be prophesying about something that's past tense that never even happened yet. 
And sometimes prophets, y'all, they'll get a prophecy from God. They'll get a vision from God, y'all. And it's as if they are there. <laughs> Something that never happened yet. Something that never took place yet. And when they get this vision, when they get this prophecy, they speak as if they did. <laughs> they speak as if they done experienced it already. You know? you know what I'm saying? And John MacArthur, he says it like this. And you know what I'm saying? I put it in my text in his historical theme, his historical theological theme, y'all. He says it like this, talking about this phrase, the day of the Lord. He speaks on how 19, yo, 19 times this, this phrase of the Lord is spoken in the Old Testament from eight different authors, yo. But then he began to narrow it down to Joel, and he says, the phrase does not have reference to a chronological time period. Meaning that this thing don't have a record, a historical record of a time frame of these days, these events happening. You know? It don't have a time frame. It's, it's not chronological. It's not something that can be, be put in a chronicle, yo. Know? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a day of the Lord. It's an event that's brought about only by the Lord himself. And it's spoken through prophecy. It's spoken through prophecy. John MacArthur says it like this. He says, but a general period of time. This thing is spoken in a general sense, in a vague sense, Miss Terra, meaning that this thing could have happened at any time, meaning that this thing could have not even happened at all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That we could be living in these times, y'all, on the cusp of these events happening. About to experience these events, and we don't even know it, Miss Terry. These events about to come upon us in these days that we live in, in Matthew, and we don't even know it. Because we don't understand prophecy. <laughs> we don't understand prophecy, y'all. And mostly all commentators, because they differ in chapter one, but mostly all commentators agree that chapter two, y'all, and chapter three is prophesying these events are all events, y'all, that has not taken place yet. They future events. That's what make this book so good, y'all, because we're dealing with something that never took place yet. We're dealing with something that our eyes never seen yet. We're dealing with something that never took place yet. In Joel, in chapter 1, he says it's so vague. He tells the people, he said, this thing going to be so bad. He said, you're going to want to tell it to your grandchildren. He said, tell it to their children and let them tell it to their children. <laughs> That's what Joel said. You know what I'm saying? And we know revelations say that we only... Ooh, we experiencing these, 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 ooh, these troubled times as birth pains. And he said, they're only going to increase, Nick. So we got to be prepared for these things. He said, I spoke unto you these things that you might know that I'm the Lord, that you might be prepared of it. Not to scare you, but that you be prepared, Nick. Ooh, that you walk in the fear and the trembling of the Lord, that you work out your own salvation. It's a time that never took place yet. It's an event of a future time, y'all. And I love this commentary, man, this Bible I bought my wife, man. It's a, it's a uh, study Bible, y'all, for women. And uh, they gather different thoughts of commentary concerning Joel. And I love how they say it because remember the day of the Lord is wrath and judgment. But for God's people, Nick, 
and for all that, that, <laughs> that, that God sees as godly. Ooh, the, the olive branch, the spiritual olive branch that's connected to his people, yo. We're going to see how this is happening in this day. He said blessings and restoration are going to be poured out at the same exact time. I don't know about you, but what side do you want to experience? I know I want to experience the restoration and blessing side, Shane. I don't want to be on the side of the wrath and judgment. And God give you a choice today. <laughs> In the Old Testament, he said, I place before you life and death. What did he say? Choose life, Shane. So we just up here placing life and death before you. We shown you the day of the Lord. We shown you how he moving in the earth. We went deep into it, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But what side you gonna fall upon? My heart is that you fall upon the restoration and the blessing side. Who, in a way that our people ain't never experienced before? We keep because look, Miss Dawn, we look back at the blessings of our people. And we say, man, if it could be like it was. <laughs> but Miss Dawn, we don't understand and know that God got a plan to where it be so be better than what it was, so greater than what it was. He always does things greater. You know? He saves the best for last, Nick. We look back at the blessing when God's saying, man, the blessing that I'm going to have for you is not even going to compare. <laughs> it's not even going to compare, man. And he tells us that even in the scriptures, man. I think it's Ezekiel or, or Zechariah when he talks about get, gathering his people from the north. He said he's going to bring his people from the north and it's going to be so great that they're going to stop talking about the deliverance of Egypt. <laughs> it's going to be so great, he said, that they're not going to even mention God delivering his people out of Egypt. You know what they're going to mention? They're going to mention God delivering his people out of the land of the north. <laughs> We're in the land of the north. We're in the land of the north. You know what I'm saying? All commentators, y'all, and theologians, they come together and they all agree that this, 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 this prophecy of chapter 2 and chapter 3 is, is all about future days. All about future days. And look what she, they say in the commentary. I love it, y'all. I was reading this thing and I'm like, man, look how he say, she said that. It's just starting off. She says that the, the book of Joel, I'm going to save that one. Ooh, ooh. I'm going to save that one because I'm going to get into something else. But they also, y'all, before we get into it, I got to tell you this. Because when you study, you're going to see it in your study. They ascribe the army. This army invading in chapter 2. They ascribe this, y'all, to the future event that never took place yet. In the book of Ezekiel, your chapter 39 and 40, y'all. They ascribe it to the, to the battle, the war of Gog and Magog. <laughs> That's what they ascribe it to. You know what I'm saying? Some theologians, they, some um, commentary, they'll tell you, that is that future time that never took place yet. And it could be. So I got to give you both sides. Just, just work with me. I got to give you both sides, y'all. They also ascribe this, this, um, this part of Tyra, Sidon, and Felicia. You know what I'm saying? Which, which borders of the Mediterranean Sea, y'all. And in Joel chapter 3, it talks about them, them selling a boy. As a harlot, Mr. Dill, and a girl at, for wine. It talks about them selling God's people, y'all, to the Grecians. 
to the Greeks. <laughs> now, John MacArthur, he so much don't want to get into this. He said, this is a time frame that's unknown. <laughs> God prophesied through Joel that his people would be sold to the Greeks. Mm. To the Greeks. And this is also connected with, with Gog and Magog because it's the war of Armageddon, y'all, that take place near Israel. And Joel talks about in chapter 3 that, that is the valley of Jehoshaphat. He said, bring the nations, all the nations, Tyre and Sidon and Felicia, all of y'all that had a part in selling my people. Because when you go read Psalms chapter 83, verse 5, it talks about the conspiracy of trying to do away with God's people and blot out their name in history. Remove them from being a nation in the earth. They also attest that time to it, yo. You know what I'm saying? And Joel speaks of that. So it could be, Nick. But what I need you to know is that this is solely talking about an end day time. It's talking about a future time, you know? This prophecy of Joel. And she speaks of it like this concerning this book. She say, the book of Joel should be read as a poetic prophet. Because there's so many different descriptions. There's so many, many different ways Joel is speaking. He say, she says it's like poetry. <laughs> but what I like the most, she conduces it to prophecy. You know what I'm saying? And then she talks about this, y'all. I love it, man. Talking about chapter 2, y'all. She says it like this. She says... The event described in this, this part of the book is, 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 is um, are set almost entirely in the future. She talks about the nation's destructive behavior towards Israel. In the future destruction are discussed in this part of the book. This second part of the book is dominant by themes, material, and spiritual blessings given to Israel, y'all. She says, God reveals himself in both judgment, but he also reveals himself in faithful love. <laughs> in faithful love, y'all. And God speaks of this in um. Uh, this love that he's going to show. And I'm going to just read it. I got to read it before we get into it. Or maybe for the sake of time, I should just let you read it. But it's Israel being restored to the land, yo. Man, I want to read this thing. Go ahead on and read. Is it, is it, uh, is it, uh, Ezekiel, yo, yo, chapter 39, verse 21. Man, I marked this whole thing out, but for the sake of time, I'm not. 21 to 29, go and read that on your, on your time. Go and read that, man. Ooh. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 21, Miss Terra, through 29. This is a beautiful, beautiful just... Man, him just, just, who just showing all the way he going to bless us. You know what I'm saying? And even we might get into this priest thing because they talk about the new city and the new temple, y'all. And how he going to wreck this Levitical priesthood again. And that's what we want to get into right quick, y'all. So now, y'all, since we have dealt with this, con this, this, this context of Scripture, I didn't give you the context, Matthew. Now it's time to go in right now. Time, where, where, where we at on the, on the time, Shane? I didn't give you the context, man, of this thing, y'all. You know what I'm saying? For the scholars, for the Bereans, y'all. To let you know we ain't just coming with anything, man. 
We done gave you the context. You know what I'm saying? I have enough my notes, y'all. We see that Joel, based upon the context, that this thing is all about a future time, a future day, y'all. We see that Joel is speaking unto a time in the future, y'all. He's prophesying unto a future day in time, y'all, that had not come to pass yet. And primarily, he's prophesying to his own people, Israel, y'all, about a prophecy that's set, y'all, set for a far distant time within the future. A future in which we find ourselves living in, I have in my notes, y'all, which is the day and age, y'all, of these New Testament times. These days we find ourselves that we living in, yo. These New Testament times. In this prophecy, Joel is speaking, yo. In these days, I have in my notes, it's getting louder and louder. <laughs> it's getting louder and louder, yo. We've seen it everywhere. We've seen it everywhere. It's getting louder and louder, y'all, this day of the Lord, him making inquisition we talked about in the upper echelon from the secular all the way down to what's supposed to be sacred. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's shaking some things, y'all. And we find ourselves in these days. It's getting louder and louder. And it's calling, y'all, I have in my notes, unto a remnant of the descendants of the original children of Israel unto their children and their children's children I have in my notes and also all the spiritual and grafted Israel y'all as a whole it's calling Matthew it's calling it's getting louder and louder and it's speaking unto the descendants of these people in these New Testament times y'all is speaking unto us. So within these New Testament times, y'all, that Joel prophesies, it's in these times. Let's bring this text to us. It's in these times that he prophesies, Miss Terror, let the priest. Mm. Now let's get to our text where we wanted to get to let the priest. I done gave you the full context. We see Joel saying, let the priest, Miss, Miss Ebony, but he's talking about in a New Testament time. So he's calling out, let the priest, he's speaking, un, let the priest, he's making this carry on call, y'all, unto the priest of the house of God, unto the priest of the house of Israel, y'all, unto the priest of the church of the living God. And within this calling, y'all, comes a question. Within this calling comes a question. I have a question for you. God has a question for you. Joel has a question for you, y'all. Where are the real priests of God? <laughs> Where are the real priests of God in these New Testament times? Where are the real priests of God, y'all? In this message, y'all, it came from a vision that God gave me. And it was years ago. My wife couldn't attest to it. It was a Sunday morning, yo, before we went to church. I went in the bathroom, y'all, and I couldn't stop crying. Mm. I couldn't stop crying, Miss Terra, for God's people. I couldn't stop crying. And he began to show me, he said, son, He said it and took this office of the priest and put a stigma upon it. Mm, God. He said it and scorned this office of the priest. He said Satan then put on the cloak ooh, of the church through this false system, this Catholic church that we've been talking about. He put on the cloak of Peter, y'all. And he brought a stigma to this name, this office of the priest. 
So much so to where we don't want to even be mentioned with this office of the priest. So much so that we run from this office of the priest. <laughs> In these New Testament times, we don't even study this office of the priest, y'all. Everybody want to be prophets. Everybody want to be kings. We don't want nothing to do with being a priest. Therefore, there's no priests in the home. <laughs> Therefore, there's no priests in the house of God. And when there's no priests, there's nobody making sacrifices. Oh, God. You say, well, Bryce, we in the New Testament. They done done away with the Levitical priesthood. I still got a question. Where are the priests? You say, well, Bryce, we in the New Testament. We, we, we not in the Old Testament of the pre, the Old Testament priesthood. Where is the priest? Well, Bryce, Aaron, who is not the priest no more. We don't have temples no more. I still beg the question. God still begs the question. Where is the priest? In these New Testament times, Matthew. Because we're not talking about a Levitical priesthood. We're talking about a priesthood. Who under the high priest who is Christ? We're not talking about a priesthood after the order of Aaron, y'all. We're talking about a priesthood after the order of of Melchizedek who Christ became high priest y'all after the order of Melchizedek I have in my notes Jesus is the high priest he's the high priest y'all our high priest after the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 through 20. Sound boot, I don't know if I gave it to you. But this is when this, this, ooh, let's, let, let's speak of it. Verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul, bored sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, y'all, where only the priest could have gone, Nick, in these Old Testament times. Before the, before the veil was torn. But we had a high priest, the Bible said in verse 20, where the, where, where the forerunner runner entered for us. He entered in for us. Even Jesus, the man Jesus, y'all, having become high priest forever. Nick, not after the order of Aaron. Not after the Levitical priesthood, but after the order of Melchizedek. After the order of Melchizedek. And this is a priesthood that started with Father Abraham in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20. Y verse 18 through 20. Which were, y'all, which were established before the Old Testament priesthood. Under the order of Aaron. This priesthood with Melchizedek, it was established before. Before the order of Aaron. Before the Old Testament priesthood. This thing predates the Old Testament, y'all. This order, this priest, Melchizedek. And we see this, y'all, being talked about in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the high, of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. He tied it, y'all. First being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, y'all. With no 
without father and without mother. He was without father and without mother. I have in my notes, and we know, y'all, that this Melchizedek is no other than the incarnated Christ. This is Christ. This is Christ, y'all. Who was also without an earthly father. Who also, y'all, is called in the book of Isaiah, the prince of priests, the pr prince of peace, who is also called king of kings and lord of law. He's the high priest in these New Testament times, Matthew. He's the high priest, y'all. So this, this priesthood is still alive and well. <laughs> He said, I come not to destroy the Old, Old Testament. I come not to destroy the law, but to do what? To fulfill it. To make all things new, Jesus said. <laughs> he made also new this, this, this priestly office, yo. He makes it new, yo. In Hebrews 5, verse 5 through 6, and I'm going to read it for the sake of time. So also... Christ did not glorify himself, yo, to become high priest. But it was he who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also said in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek who was also prophesied about, y'all, in the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Psalms chapter 100, um, 110, verse 4. You know what I'm saying? Thousands of years before Jesus, y'all. He said, the Lord sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. I have in my notes, y'all, and based upon Jesus, being the high priest, yo, he made us to be priests in these New Testament times. He made us to be priests, yo, to minister to the Lord, but what? Stand in the gap. A priest is one who goes to God on the behalf of the people, yo. And our next point, we're going to get into the priest, he said, weep between the porch and the altar. And this is all about prayer, all about intercession, yo. And we're going to get into this prayer because that's what Brian Trado said. He said, he said, tell me when the last time you really hit your knees and started to intercede for everything your family needs. Tell me when the last time. Tell me when the last time. That's what Brian Trado said, yo. Having a burden for this priestly office. I'm here to call back the priest in you. I'm here to call back the priest in Israel, man. Where the priests of the Most High stand up. In these New Testament times, y'all. We operate not under the priest of the, Le of the Levitical system, but the priest's office under Christ's system. And he goes by example. He's the front runner. The Bible says that he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercessory for us daily. For us daily. Operating in his priestly office, Nick. Operating in his priestly office. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 through 6 tells us that. He tells us who he is once you blood bought, once you bought by Christ. He said, come to the throne room, calf, boldly. <laughs> he said, you could come boldly because you're coming not in, in your own representation. You're not coming in the Old Testament Levitical priesthood, Miss Ebony. When you go to the Father, you are coming as the high priest of Christ. <laughs> the Bible said we seated in heavenly places 
with Christ Jesus, yo. Do you know who you are tonight? He say, X. I was on this scripture today going, um, <laughs> within the week. He say, X, and it shall be given. He says, seek, and you will find. He say, knock, and the door will be open. He didn't say it might be open, no. He said it will be open. He said it will be open. Revelations tells us of this priestly office that we have. Verse 5, and, and from Christ Jesus, the faithful witness, y'all, perfect, faithful in all his ways to God. The Bible says he always do what please the Father. Oh, do you know who you're in right now? Man, you got, to understand, you got to understand this, man. He said a firstborn from the dead and the ruler over kings on the earth. Don't you know, Nick, that he ruled over kings on the earth? The Bible say that, that the king, the, the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand. And he turns it whatever way he wants. Who holding some things for you tonight? Who keeping you from some things? What you think that's too hard to obtain? Is people in high positions holding it from you? Huh? He said he is over kings. Oh, God. The Bible says he turns the king heart in whichever way he wants. We blame the things that we don't have on other people. <laughs> when all we got to do is ask. All we got to do is ask, Ms. Don. All we got to do is ask. He said to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yo. He loved us and he washed us from our sins with his own blood. For what could wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He washed us. He purged us with his own blood. And why? What did he, why, why did he do it, y'all? And has made us kings and priests. Kings and priests. Mm, God. He had made us kings and priests. Not just kings, yo, but priests. <laughs> the priest was so high up, yo. That's why he places the priest on the side of the king. Because it was some things that only the king could do in the Old Testament. But you got to understand in the Old Testament, it was some things that only the priest could have done. The king would try to get into the priest's office and the Lord would strike him dead. Ask Uzziah about it. Ask King Uzziah about it. Who tried to do the priestly work. Yo, and God struck him dead. He places it on the same level with kings, Miss Ebony. <laughs> He didn't put prophets in there. Oh, God. He said kings and priests. Mm. If I could get you to pick up this priestly office. Again, which is on the same level with kings. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to tell you, man. You think you only could get things. Through being kings in the earth. I'm trying to give you another way of getting it. 
I'm trying to show you will stand right upon the same level. You a priest, Matthew. Bought with his blood. Oh, God. The priest goes to God on the behalf of the people. For us to go to God on the behalf of somebody else, calf, that means we got to be in right relationship with God. <laughs> and the priest had to be right, y'all. I got this book that we went through with Israel, man. Shout out to Israel about the priest. And we probably going to get into it and I'm going to break it down for you. We're going to go down this priestly office and show you how it's important to be a priest. We're going to talk about the garments. We're going to talk about all these things, y'all, how it was important, even in these days, Miss Terra. Because when you align yourself up to be a priest, you know you can't play with God. <laughs> the priest had to tie a rope around them just to go behind the veil, y'all. Because if they was in sin, if they was cutting up, Miss Terra, they would have had to drag them out of there because God was going to smoke them. So the priest understood that before I go to God, I got to be right. <laughs> I got to be right. How can I go to God on the behalf of my family if I'm not right? How can I go to God on the behalf of my church if I'm not right? How can I go to God on the behalf of my people? He said, weep between the porch and the altar if I'm not right. They're going to have to drag me up out of that, Nick. But when I understand this, I take pride. <laughs> In this office of the priest. This is not no stigma. Nah, this has nothing to do with this false priest system of the cat. Who Satan used to take this cloak of the priest. But we're in the days where God is bringing it back to Peter. Oh, God. He's giving Peter his cloak back, y'all. The dispensation is switching from Paul back to Peter. It's switching from the, the, the apostle of the Gentiles to the apostle of the Hebrews. <laughs> it's switching back, y'all. And I weep when God began to show me this about how Satan used this church. You got to understand this Catholic church, y'all. We told you they're the people of the prince. They came through with them crosses on their shirt, making inquisition, killing whole villages, yo. Forcing people to be Catholics. Killing the real Christians. Go study John Huss. Go, stu go study William Tyndale. Go study, yo. Uh, you know what I'm saying? William Tyndale, John Huss, John Wycliffe. Ooh, go study that. Write them names down. These were real Christians. Who this Catholic false beast system was slaughtered. Revelation says she, she what? She full of the blood of the saints. She sits on the beast. We talked about that these two beasts, also the other one, Esau, the upper echelon, this false fake Jew system, yo. Who came out of the land, who looked like a lamb, got horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Let's get back to this Levitical priesthood. One more scripture and we closing, y'all. This is why Peter tells us, talking primarily to Israel, based upon prophecy from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 6, how God promised, y'all, 
Jesus is talking about his calling, talking about coming and bringing yo. He, he, he talks about his calling that, 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 that the anointing of the Lord is upon him. <laughs> that he come to lose the bands of wickedness, lose the captive, shame. He come to proclaim the gospel. Jesus talked about his calling, and in that calling, he promised us in Isaiah 61, 6, he said, and you shall be priests. <laughs> That's what he promised us, y'all. And Peter, understanding that Peter, y'all, spoke up in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, but you are a chosen race in the verse conception I have. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the acceptable, the, um, that you may proclaim the excellency of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Where are the priests called? And we're going to go deeper until we're going to unveil this, this, this office of the priest. And then we're going to go into to, um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, y'all. Or 2 Timothy, I think, chapter 2, verse, verse 1 through 3. And we're going to just go into this prayer. He said, he say, first of all, first of all, oh, God. Prayer, supplication, intercession. <laughs> and we're going to touch all these elements of prayer, Nick. Because there's different ways in which we could pray. It's petition. It's a legal right in prayer. You don't understand that. It's warfare prayer. You don't understand that. You got spiritual things that's got you bound. Oh, and you don't even know how to use it. He said, what you loose on earth going to be loose. He said, what you bound going to be bound in heaven going to be in agreement with you. How much more to loose and bound these things in prayer? Oh, God. You don't know about the spiritual language of prayer that he gave you that edifies you. <laughs> you don't understand the gifts that he gave you in this power called prayer. That the priest who is head of. Jesus sits and make intercession. For the saints, y'all. He came and, and sacrificed himself, shedding his blood for us, y'all. In the Old Testament time, the priests had to come with bulls and goats daily to suffice for the people's sin. But our high priest, he sacrificed him on self, put him on self, on the altar once and for all. For past sin, but also for future sin. Ooh. That's why he's saying First John 5, 9, he said, if, if you have sinned, he said, confess your sin to him who is able to forgive you. But not only able to forgive you, but to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Through this power of prayer. So, Father, we thank you for this office of the priest, God. And we just ask that you be with us, God, as we dive deeper into this office, God. And that you use us in these last days, God, to stand up as your priest has got to answer the call of Joel in these New Testament times, God. Not under the priesthood of Aaron, but under the priesthood of Melchizedek, God. 
who is after the order of Christ, who is the carnated Christ daddy, a priest forever, who have made us priests, says God. Oh, daddy, bless us. Let this word speak to us in a deep way, God, even when we get home, God, even when we go and we ride about, God. Let this word be tugging upon our hearts, God, to run to you in prayer, God, to stand in the office of the priest, God, to be priests of our house, to be priests, God, in your house, God, to make sure you have everything you need to minister unto you, God. Whether it be through sacrifice, whether it be through offerings, God, the priest honor you. He say, honor me with thy substance. Whether it be for the Lord, through us just, just making ourselves available, God. Us standing in the gap for others. Because that's what our high priest does. He stands in the gap for others. And Father, we thank you. So, Lord, we believe, Lord, in your dead burial and the resurrection of your dear son. We believe in all that he did, God, to suffice us and cause us to walk right and be right before you, shedding his blood. The only thing that could wash away our sins, God. And you say all that called upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So, Daddy, we humble ourselves. We don't look at nobody else, God. We don't look down, but we look up, God, to you. And we humble ourselves. Well, Father, then we ask you, Daddy, to save us. We ask you, God, to fill us up with your spirit. We ask you to make us new, God. We ask you to wipe away, God, every sin, God, both known and unknown, conscious and unconscious, God. We ask you to deal, God, in ways that only you know, things that we shame of, God, that we might be able to stand as priests for you. First receiving your dead burial and resurrection. And then allowing you to wash us and keep our hearts right before you. That we might be able to sit at your feet, Lord. Ooh, sweet spirit, just, just resting in this place. We thank you for it, Lord. I believe you tugging on your people heart to pray, God. They see the situations they're in. They see the circumstance. And you but a prayer away, Lord. You ready to move for their family members. You but a prayer away, Lord. You ready to move in the church. You but a prayer away, Lord. You ready to move in the Hebrews, in your people in these last days. You but a prayer away, Lord. Make us priests again, Master. We thank you for your, your son. Favor us, God. Cover us as we go forth. We thank you for being our God, our Lord. We give you glory and honor and praise. We say these things, Master. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Man, such a sweet spirit in here. Oh, God. And love Ooh, God. Jesus. Such a sweet spirit. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. I love you, 
Jesus I worship and adore you Let us stand Just all over the building right now Just stand tell you, Lord we love you more than anything Wherever you are right now whatever is going on just Reach out to God right now and let him know how much you love him. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, we love you more than anything. Oh, 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 said I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than any. And I worship and, and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Most gracious and all wise God. Lord, Father, we thank you for the word that has been preached into our hearts tonight, Lord God. We thank you for the word of understanding Lord, about prayer. Father, we pray tonight in the name of Jesus that there's any distractions, any hindrances, anything that's keeping us from calling on you in earnest prayer, Lord God. Remove it right now in the name of Jesus. We pray right now that you would just, if we're, if we're not where we need to be, if we're not in the proper position, Lord God, in our hearts, not just to receive from you, but even to call on your name, get us in the right position, Lord. Let us be in the right place where we can allow ourselves to be before you in your throne room. Father, as the as the man of 